once said that there are those who love the Stooges and those who just wonder why. <laughs> Even today, there's no compromise. You either love them or you hate them. He grabs Kirk by the neck like that, see? And drags him over to the letter press. See? Then he smacks him on the head like that. Then he pokes his coconut into the letter press. See, like that. Then he says, I'll squeeze the cider out of your Adam's apple. Then he gives him the works like this. Then he keeps turning and twisting. Ted Healy was the man responsible for the formation of the Stooges. As the straight man, he dished out all the abuse while his various Stooges responded to his order. Hello, Ben. Gee, hello. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. How are you? Still hard of hearing, eh? Yeah. I'm glad to see you, Ben. Yeah. How, how do you like the beer? Oh, well, I've been cockeyed since I've been drinking it. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Say, Ben, it's just you and I, so I'll buy a drink. Just oh. Nobody at the bar, so you don't Nobody, it's you and I. How are you, boy? Okay, I'll take such and so then. You will, eh? I love that nonsense. Oh, listen, I beg your pardon. Because Please, I beg you. Uh, is your name Ted Heal? No, Ted Healy the name is, not Heal. Oh, it's... listen, did you originate stogies? What? Are you the first one that ever had stogies? Say, pardon me, I want you to be a nice boy. When you're a nice boy, your fairy godmother always watches over you. Your what? Your fairy godmother always watches over you. I got an uncle I'm not sure of. I know that. Now, go ahead. Let me hear more about that. But no, I want to know. You know, I know. But I know how you make people laugh. You do, huh? Yes, I say. How? Uh-huh. No, you're wrong, lady. She's wrong, isn't she? Yeah, this is the way. Mm. Thank you, time. He's here. wrong. This, this is relax. the way. Do that again. Do that again. It's hooked. It's hooked. He's wrong. Now, this is the way, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Pardon me. Healy had come up through the ranks of vaudeville, and he was a huge star on the stage. He had known the Howard brothers, Moe and Shemp, since they were kids. In the first lineup, he used Shemp, pictured in the cowboy hat. That's uh, Ted in the band leader's outfit. Lou Warren wearing the wide-brimmed hat, and Dick Higgins in the genie getup. Healy assembled his next bunch of stooges with the old faithful Shemp, his brother Mo Howard, and a funny-looking guy with the hair of a wild porcupine named Larry Fine. They were a hit in vaudeville shows such as A Night in Venice, and in 1930 made their first screen appearance in the Fox production Soup to Nuts, with fourth stooge, Freddie Sanborn. They worked on and off with Ted, calling the act Three Lost Souls, The Racketeers, and the Southern Gentleman, as well as the Three Stooges. Curiously, as the act built momentum, Shemp left to pursue a solo career. When I was very, very young, maybe about nine years of age, I was living in Brooklyn, and so were the three boys, because I didn't know it. One day I was walking down the street, and sure enough, there I saw Mo coming toward me, and uh, his brother Shemp, Shemp Howard, was working on a uh, series called Joe Palooka. It was... Uh, Actually, two reelers, shorts, and uh, he was supposed to be, I guess, a trainer. And I had a marvelous time with the three fellas just hanging around the studio. Shemp worked solo with RKO, doing a stooge act of his own. Here's a clip from the rare Knife of the Party. Wait a minute, fellas. That's my new saw. What do you want? What is this? What do I want? Yeah. How do you like that? Say, why don't you leave them alone? Oh, oh stop. Oh. Don't tell me what is. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little too quick for you, ain't I? Now, wait a minute. That's the way to open coconuts. Give me that. Why don't you use your heads? Come on, get together here. Right into it, boys. For old glory. Now, wait a minute. I got the piece I want. With Shemp out of the picture, his younger brother Jerome connived his way into the group against Ted's wishes. He shaved his head and became Curly, and the boys signed with MGM where they starred in a series of musical shorts and features. I was wondering if y'all could tell me where I could find Mr. Gallagher. What do uh, you want Mr. Gallagher for? Well, I'd kind of like to talk to him about that seven pounds. About the seven pounds? Curly was a sensation. His general appearance and manic actions were nothing short of genius and would ultimately make him the most adored stooge. Come here. 
Okay, boss. What's the matter? We're going to have an audition. An audition? No, an audition. You heard me. See that girl went upstairs? Yeah. We're going to give it a brush off. Oh, the brush off? Yeah. Same instrument. No, it's we're going to sing. Oh, oh you, 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 you're talking to one of the best musicians in the country. How are you in the city? Oh, hey, you boy. This I'm wrong. We're not going to sing it. We're going to play it. Get the instrument. You heard me, didn't you? Well, we could sing it. You know I'm the boss, don't you? Sang, don't get organized okay, now. Come okay, on, get okay. the dance. Get organized. Ready? Right. 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 Three, four. Close the door. Five, six. Brush her off. In 1934, with Healy being groomed for stardom by MGM, Moe, Larry, and Curly, now known as the Three Stooges, began the longest-running contract in show business with Columbia Pictures. They shook hands with studio boss Harry Cohn once a year and became Columbia's hottest property. made nearly 200 shorts and guest appearances and features, and as long as Harry Cohn ran Columbia, the boys had a job. When they weren't making pictures, they were on the road doing live shows. They worked relentlessly, all the time. Live, they would fracture audiences, be it at the top of the bill, ball game, or a nightclub. My impression of uh, of the Three Stooges, they were three definite personalities, no question about it. Oh, yeah. They were as unlike as three people could possibly be, and yet, of course, they had a common bond. They had their, their work. Well, my impression, uh, and I have strong impressions, that uh, Mo was the leader, and he, he kept that group together. He was the one that... Uh, was the serious one, and he was the one that was uh, the business man, you might say, of the group. Moe was born Harry Horwitz, and like his brothers Shemp and Curly, yearned for the life of show business. He pursued the vaudeville trail with Shemp, doing a blackface act and touring with a riverboat company. At home, Moe was very much a family man, showering his kids with presents and keeping a camera around at all times. Mo and I had a relationship that others didn't even know. We used to visit each other's home. He'd visit my family. I'd go out with him on, on charity um, gatherings and so on and whatnot. But we also had deals made. When Mo made a deal with me, a handshake was as good as a contract. And he was the voice in all of their uh, doings. One of the things that struck me in corresponding with Mo Howard was that he seemed to be a very sentimental man. Uh, he, he really reminisced with great fondness and with a certain kind of melancholy about some of the colleagues 
that had since died and uh, people that he enjoyed working with. You was called to be a witness, wasn't you? Certainly. So was you. What are you buttoning in for? Uh, You're supposed to be a good one, ain't you? Well, ain't I? Now, what are you just in the court for? Here. Get on. Born Louis Feinberg, Larry was an accomplished violinist and dancer as well as funny man. His father pushed him into showbiz by paying him to leave his jewelry trade. Larry performed with the Haney sisters in vaudeville and eventually married Mabel Haney when he teamed up with the Stooges in 1925. Always happy-go-lucky, he cared little for business and spent his paychecks on luxuries and horse races. He was the middle stooge, and his attempts at keeping peace with the other two usually ended up with Larry receiving a good slap or a poke. Look at that. We better do something fast. Yeah. Larry, happy-go-lucky guy that was very eager for the scene to finish so he could go off to the races. It was as if he was there because he had to be. And the minute it finished, all that he had on his mind was go to the races, to the fights, or the ball game. He always had guys around him that were talking about sports. I mean, hardly the script, ever. Mo was very serious. Shemp would listen. But Larry, what do I got to do? Let's finish it and go. Uh, Larry, uh, often his ideas were irrelevant, but once in a while he'd come up with something that was so wild that it might turn out to be a gem. He... Uh, he was, uh, I believe, the. Uh, he was a bit flaky. Wait a minute, hold still. I'll get it. Oh! Oh my nose! Undoubtedly, the most loved stooge was Jerome, better known as Curly. Curly was described as the life of the party, and since he had very little show business experience before he joined the act, he relied on his natural personality to get him a place in the lineup. In one-on-one -on -one situations, he was uh, reserved and somewhat difficult to get to know personally. But with his pals Mo and Larry, the little kid in him would shine. Curly was one of the few true but seldom recognized comedy geniuses. Take off your hat. Now raise your right hand. Now place your left hand here. Take off your hat. Raise your right hand. Now put your left hand here. Please take off your hat. Raise your right hand. <laughs> now put your left hand here. Will you please take off your hat? Raise your right hand. Now put your left hand here. Take off your hat. Raise your right hand. Will you get rid of that hat? Raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth all truth and nothing but the truth? Huh? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth all truth and nothing but the truth? Are you trying to give me the double talk? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Why don't you answer him? He's talking big Latin. I don't know what he's saying. He's asking you if you swear. No, but I know all the words. He's asking you if you'll swear to tell the truth. Truth is stranger than fiction, Judgey Wudgey. <laughs> Kindly address this court as your honor and take the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Me. What have I got to lose? Take the stand. Where do I put it? No, no. Take the stand. I got it. Now what will I do with it? Sit down. Curly's ex-wife Elaine remembers the boyish Curly and his love for animals. Well... At one time, I remember very well, we had a little dog, and uh, he, uh, I came home, and I wasn't that crazy about dogs, and this dog uh, 
went out with me for a walk. And he saw Curly coming down the street, and he ran right in front of a car and got killed in front of us both. So I, I kept running because I didn't want to go home, and Curly was so upset. But Mo had the brother to this dog, and he gave it to Curly, so we had another dog to go with him. In every town the boys would perform in, Curly would buy a dog that would later wind up at home to drive his wives crazy. Uh, the only thing that I knew about Babe was that he, uh, he always liked to talk about women. He was, uh, he, he liked, he liked that. And, uh, oh, Curly, I beg your pardon. Uh, he was commonly known as Curly, or his name was Babe. Mo's name for Curly, uh, uh that, that's, they, they called him Babe. Actress Julie Gibson remembers working with Curly in Three Smart Saps. And they said I had to marry Curly. And I was so upset because of the three Stooges, the one I liked the least was Curly because he had a shaved head. Of course, this was pre-Kojak and it was pre-Bald uh, is Beautiful, Yul Brynner, you know. So I thought he was ugly with that shaved head. And the worst thing was that I guess he was so painfully shy that he really did not know how to communicate with you. So the minute they said cut, poor Curly was just, uh, he just disappeared into the woodwork. You're in a court, not in Clancy's pool room. Sit down. I'm a victim of circumstance. Uh, who are you hitting? Oh, God. Be quiet. In most, you know, incidents, we'd, we'd go to nightclubs, and of course he was a cut-up. We were out in public. And he'd, uh, he'd take um, spoons and uh, bend them and play them to music. He was very talented musically. And he'd take a, a tablecloth off the table and he'd tear it to the music. And then it would appear on our bill when we left the nightclub. <laughs> we paid for it. <laughs> Why don't you say so? There it is. Ooh. I think what made them funny was a certain amount of experience. They were experienced comics, and they were working with a lot of old hands. So many of the people behind the camera on the Stooges films were veterans of the Max Sennett studio and other of the pioneer comedy studios in Hollywood. These guys really knew comedy, and what's more, they went and showed their films to audiences. They saw the audience reaction. So they knew whether they were succeeding or not, and they learned from their mistakes. So that by the time they got around to working with the Stooges, who had, of course, come through vaudeville and the stage and had that audience contact, you're talking about people who really knew their business. The three Stooges are three living caricatures. This is how I conceived them, how I treated them. Um, and I had a lot of very... Very great help. Gosh, Columbia had such a great, wonderful stock company at that time. Uh, there, there were great, wonderful, beautiful people. I, uh, I'm very fortunate to have known most of them and, and worked with a lot of them. Besides Jock Mahoney and the lovely Christine McIntyre, the Stooges Stock Company included the familiar faces of Billy Gilbert, Kenneth McDonald, Phil Van Zant, Bud Jameson, and the versatile Emil Sitka, who could and would do anything. Now, the old man, on a stage, I've done it in many ways, you know. Depends on what the role called for. It could be a tragedy, a comedy, or a drama. So it wasn't too new for me to do an old man, but uh, in this script with uh, Jules White directing, it was Amos Flint, the first old man I did with the Stooges. Maybe you guys remember that? In All Gummed Up. Now, as the guy was making me up, I could feel that I was getting older and older and older, and my gosh, I, I had to be snappy and sassy and whatnot, and I felt it like it, and somehow, reading the script, I knew how it should fit in. I had to be cantankerous and somebody that should get slapped in the mouth or hit in the face, and I fit in with the Stooges, and it's the one time that Jules White let me do it the way I came on. 
Bridalist Groom, that was under Ed Burns. Entirely different director. Entirely different approach. He allowed me to create the character. Or he would give me a lot of leeway. How would you do it anymore? And I would come up because on a stage I did that many times. But when these two just start wrecking my house and all I'm supposed to do is perform a, a wedding ceremony with dignity and, and uh, get my cash and let them get out of there, that one line, I guess I put all the feeling I had. Hold hands, you birds. Or hold hands, you love birds. Hold hands, you love birds. <laughs> Then there was the boy's arch nemesis, Vernon Dent. Yeah, Vernon was a close friend and a very obliging man, and he did his best. He was an excellent actor, and he would not insist on sitting in conferences and polishing scripts for his own talents. He'd let you do that. He just did his level best what you gave him to do. Hey, fellas! A customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've really that. come to the right place. You bet. This is the store where your dollars have more sense. Say, we've got the very sport coat you're looking for. I don't want a coat. But listen, mister, we're going to give you a box. Where did you ever get this mess? I bought it here. Oh, what a beautiful masterpiece. <laughs> here. Yeah. Isn't it a beauty? Genuine import. Smell the ocean. And it's 200% wool. 200%? Yeah, these sheep led a double life. Yes, sir. Uh, and I'll just throw them right in there. Yes, I don't want you. Right will you? Hey, okay. okay, uh, I don't want a coat. I don't want a coat. I don't want a coat. Oh, you don't, don't want, want a coat. coat. Well, he wants is a pair of identical shoes. Identical shoes? Yeah, identical shoes. Well, 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 Here you are, brother. Slick slack. Try him off the side. Oh, yes. Try him right on. We can move. <laughs> Gee, officer, we yeah. can... Quiet! You birds realize you just let two mark and the bank robbers slip right through my hands? I ought to run you in. Please, officer. I got six wives and two kids. Honest, yeah. officer. There was nobody came in here. Well, he's in the neighborhood. Keep a sharp lookout. I'll be back. Right. Right. A typical day on the set? Well, I tell you, you know, a lot of people think it might have been like a circus or something like that. It wasn't. It was more like an operating room. Surgery. Believe it or not, the soldiers were real professionals, you know. They showed up to work like a workman, dressed with their hair combed back and whatnot. But once they got their suits on, they, I say clown suits, they were ready for what is precision timing of every scene that they're about to do. So when the lights came on, the director says, All right, let everybody on a set. And that whole big crew stands still with their jobs ready. It was like you're going to perform surgery and everything has to be precisely timed. Okay. What? And working with the Stooges was not easy. Uh, you had to maintain a, a severity of countenance. Uh, well, everything that I did, you, you couldn't let what the Stooges were doing behind you register on your face, although they were going crazy or with whatever they were doing. Uh, uh, you, you had to be straight, and uh, the boys could do anything that they, <laughs> they were marvelous. Yeah, one of the things that I remember about these fellows was they were all very friendly. But once in a while, when they had a scene where Mo would give them hell and start smacking them, and then they'd start smacking each other, and they would do the scene to perfection and would never hesitate. But the minute the camera stopped, then they would start swearing at each other and hating each other. I thought they were going to kill each other at times, you know? But sometimes maybe a door was narrower than they planned to go through. Maybe sometimes the uh, window that they were going was not quite the size. So a lot of, some things would happen. And then what would take place is an argument between the Stooges. And if you think they talk like they did on the screen, you're mistaken. They used the saltiest language you ever heard. And between them, it was funnier to watch them argue about who should go first before they go through the door so that someone didn't get caught on the doorknob or whatever. And, and, or how, who did the right, wrong, right thing. 
That argument sometimes would go on for five, ten minutes. Of course, they worked it out, but it was funny to watch. They usually had the slaps and the pokes and the, and the, uh, all, all the good things going. And if you didn't rehearse them and you didn't, it, it, it's like choreographing a dance. Uh, everything has to come on a cue. And uh, you don't pull anything out of the woodwork uh, as a surprise. Because if you did, uh, somebody got hurt. And that's not the name of the game. And as you know, they were so physical that uh, it's very easy to get hurt. Why don't you tell me? What? Shut up. Let him alone. Oh, oh. Cut it. oh. man. Oh! Oh! Mm -hmm. that. Oh! 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 You know, the sound effects are not in place when you're shooting. I'm doing a scene for the first time where I light a cig uh, cigar. I almost did something like I'm doing here. I put the match in the light, try to light it with a cigar. But uh, rock comes through the window. The telephone rings. I'm supposed to hear the crash of the window, feel the rock hit my foot, and uh, do something with the telephone. All kind of sounds. And there are no, no sounds. I don't hear the rock come through. I don't feel that thing hit me on the foot. It's not a real rock. It's made out of sackcloth or something. And so I have several different sounds to contend with. Pretend that the phone rings and answer as if I heard it ring and it's not ringing. A window doesn't crash and so on. So it took a lot of timing to do. Uh, we had a young man named Joe Henry, H-E-N-R-I-E, who was pretty close to being a genius in sound effects. And he loved the Stooges and expended enormous time and effort uh, in getting uh, the sound effects that I believe had a great deal to do with the success of the Stooge films. Uh, he would experiment endlessly with uh, such things as musical saws, uh, bass drums. Uh, he would uh, roll drums, uh, oil drums across the cement floor to give a certain kind of rumble and pluck violin strings and make these odd sound effects. And then in uh, editing them in, he displayed great patience and great skill. Joe Henry, the Three Stooges owe a very great deal to an unsung hero, sound effects editor, and later head of the sound effects department at Columbia, Joe Henry. <laughs> I think I see it. Oh! Oh! pies were not used. They had several disadvantages. One, they'd spoil in during a long, hot day's shooting. Two, they'd stain everything they came in contact with. And three, they wouldn't stand up being thrown. Ray Hunt, who was a marvelous comedy prop man, he, he was the prop man on all of the Columbia two-reelers for as far back as I can remember. Um, he used to concoct them out of a mix mixture of shaving cream and other things. Now, the shaving cream, for one thing, washed clean, didn't stain. Pies were generally thrown at short range. If you uh, analyze one of the pie-throwing two-reelers, you'll find that almost all the hits were in extreme close-up. They're funnier, the closer the funnier, and the closer the more accurate the thrower was. Uh, Ray Hunt threw most of them. Uh, our as I call them, our demon prop men. When Edward Burns or Elwood Ullman or any of the other great Stooges writers would work on a script, a lot of inspiration came from just having the boys around. I like to have the boys in on it. Uh, they seldom contributed much to structure. The structure was up to us. That uh, would be uh, Elwood Ullman and to me if I was writing it. Uh, but... I love to have them reminiscing and uh, uh, telling about the things that had happened to them. Mo was very helpful. Mo was an intelligent man compared to Curly and Larry, who were not quite as intelligent. Mo had good, good comedy sense. I must say this for them. They were very helpful men. 
They tried anything that was possible to make the picture better. What's the idea? I'm sorry you stepped into me. I've been a compulsive diary keeper, so I have the exact dates when a lot of things, these things happened. The diary said, walked on the set just in time to see Curly fold up. Well, that undoubtedly, no one knew it at the time, but that undoubtedly was the first of his strokes. Uh, I guess everyone assumed it was just a fainting spell. On his next to last film, uh, uh, Monkey Businessman, uh, it, it was an ordeal for everyone. Uh, he, we had to shoot his lines one, one, one line at a time. On the very next film he did, with Jules White as director, he passed out on the set, and that was obviously the stroke that disabled him, prevented him from doing any more work. With Curly's stroke forcing him to leave the act, a chapter ended on the world's biggest comedy act. Curly's untimely demise faced the boys with a tremendous decision. Who to replace him? Re-enter Champ Howard. And why not? He was brother to both Mo and Curly, had been with them originally, knew all the routines, and had actively been featured in comedies since he left the act in the early 30s. Very quickly and without much fanfare, they made the transition from Curly back to Shemp in 1946. Oh, in Bridless Groom, uh, there was a scene that required Christine McIntyre to slap Shemp around. Well, Christine was a real lady, which to me, added a dimension to uh, the Roughneck Stooges. Uh, she, uh, she had a degree in music from a music college in Chicago, and it was not in her nature to slap anyone around. But uh, when it came to do the scene, she held back, and Shemp, after several poor takes, begged her to cut loose and really do it right. And she did. Come in! Cousin Basil! Uh, uh, I've just been dying to meet you. Uh, uh, You're uh, even cuter than that lady said you were. Oh, oh, oh boy, big sense. Listen to those kisses. Cutter. Oh, you must be exhausted after your long trip. Sit down. Let me look at you, cousin Basil. Oh, now don't you go away. funniest of them all, in my estimate. He was the type that, that didn't tell you what he's going to do, just like Curly. But when the cameras turned on, he put in a lot of funny stuff, especially on his own, that weren't in the script. <laughs> what are you stalling around for? Oh, 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 oh. You know you've got to rush order to get out. Get Mr. Grant's pants and hand press them. All right, all right, but where are they? I pinned them up in the shade. What'd you do with them? I didn't touch them. Uh-oh. Uh. Here, hurry up and press those. What are you staying around for?
secretary, but no job. In the early 50s, the Stooges began making television appearances while continuing their stage act. Here's a rare clip of the Stooges climbing around with Ed Wynn. And here comes the CBS executive. Mush, look at Mush! 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 I know this is an extravagant waste of money. Here, boy, take this rug and beat it. <laughs> There's no way for a vice president to talk. Oh! Man, what is this whole thing anyhow? We are the CBS Brain Trust. This is our vice president in charge of soap Oh, the president in charge of soap operas. How do you do? <laughs> is our vice president in charge of cutting costs. Why, certainly I'll cut the cost right away. There it is, right there. Give me that. All right. Unbutton your coat, stupid. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Gentlemen, the vicissitudes of one's circumstances and surroundings makes it nigh impossible to state one's feelings, which entitles you to additional chastisement. Prepare for the double zinger. No, 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 no not, not the, the double zinger. zinger. No. <laughs> there, there, there. Put your fingers out like that. Now hold your arms out that way. On your mark. Get set. Go. Oh. <laughs> the Stooges' popularity had not decreased, and all was well until death struck the Stooges again. On the way home from the fights, Shemp suffered a heart attack and died. Moe and Larry were once again faced with the decision of disbanding or replacing Shemp. The final four shorts featuring Shemp were filmed after death using a double and stock footage while Moe and Larry looked for a new stooge. Keep him covered, Gunner. Not me, him. I'll go get help. Well, you're such a nuisance. Comedian Joe Besser joined up in 1956, bringing his big sissy character to the Roughneck Stooges. Blue oh, fat man got him! Oh, you snitch! In 1958, Columbia closed the doors on its shorts department, and it looked as though the Stooges were finished. But, due to the wonders of television, by 1959, the Stooges were on top once again. I don't look now, but I think we're about to be killed. In 1960, director Jules White put together several stooge shorts featuring Curly, along with ventriloquist Paul Winchell, in what was one of their first feature films. Dorita, dubbed Curly Joe for his physical resemblance to Moe's brother Curly, joined the act in 1959. A seasoned burlesque performer, Curly Joe's simple style and the age of the boys themselves caused the violent slapstick to be toned down, and uh, the emphasis was put on a more childlike type of comedy. And let us ride. And it's really Simonized, is it? Watch this. Sure, it's Simonized. Look at that giant. We'll be famous. We'll make a fortune. We'll call it, uh, Instant Simonize. Instant Simonize, you lame brain. 
But then all these spy instant Simon Eyes everywhere. Instant Simon Eyes? They saw there were two. Simon Eyes thinks of everything. Try Instant Simon Eyes, another easy new way to brighten your day from Simon Eyes Company. The boys were now in their late 60s and were working just as hard as ever making personal appearances, doing television shows and cutting up in public wherever they went. It was 1969 and the Stooges were working on what was to be their last film when lovable Larry suffered a stroke that forced him to leave the act. He spent his final years in the motion picture country home and occasionally made personal appearances in schools. He even wrote a book on his life in show business. Mo, now in his 70s, was determined to continue the act, even without Larry. And many times, in those 30 years, after Shemp died, he would say to me, he says, you're going to be a stooge one day. I said, oh, come on, Mo, you know, I'm better than that. No, he said, I, and I want you to, how it was to be or come about, I just used to dismiss it as a compliment. Until, what, years later go? Sure enough. Mo says, what I tell you, you're going to be a stooge. The picture's uh, gonna, is, uh, in the works. It's all ready. It's planned. It's definite. It's positive. The contracts are drawn up. And sure enough, it was for the jet set to be shot in Palm Springs. I am the stooge. It's official. Now we're waiting for Mo. Mo calls and says they're shooting. They want us on a set next week, but we're going to postpone it for a week. So I'm still on with the, I'm with the thing, and very much so going to make a good job of it. And Joe accepted the fact we had this uh, meeting, and Mo says that we can, we don't even need to rehearse because you know how to do it, and I know you're going to come up with a good character and so on. Time goes, another week, he postponed. Producer calls me, there's something wrong with Mo. I don't know, but I feel like he should try to find out because he has a feeling something like Mo's wife calls me, puts it off another week, and so on. Pretty soon another call comes. Stooges is dead. Meaning Mo died. Come to the funeral anymore. Would ever imagine that the underdogs of comedy, the Three Stooges, would be called the funniest guys in the world. Although they never achieved widespread critical acclaim, they did succeed in accomplishing what they had always intended to do. They made people laugh. Certainly. Hey, Mo, 